Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2DCC webinar series. Today we have Dr. Jean-Paul Alon. He is the professor and department head in the Department of Nuclear Engineering. Um, today he's going to be talking about probing the first layer of atoms, manipulating and observing matter in nanoscale self-organized systems. Dr. Alon, please go ahead. All right, Lloyd. Thank you, Kevin. And, and uh, thank you, Eric, for the invite. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. And um, hopefully you can hear me OK. All right, very good. So yeah, very happy to be here. Um, Zoom is definitely not the medium that I prefer to, to do these things. I, I love to be able to be in person and get to meet you and, and interact. But um, uh, by all means, if there's anything that I talk about today that you'd like to chat about, um, you know, I'd love to, to be able to get together through, through Zoom and, and expand on what you're gonna hear today. Now, um, you know, Eric, had been asking me to to give you to give a talk to all of you for a while now, and uh, we managed to 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 figure out how to do that. Um, I think that part of the challenge in, in in any type of talk like this is, of course, the level of detail that we want to delve in. And so, what I wanted to do is for this, for this group is to at least share um, uh, some of the work that we've done in my group over the years in the uh, context of uh, not only probing um, low dimensional states or uh, let's say probing depths that are, that are in the range of a few monolayers to a few nanometers, but also doing it in a, in a manner in the context, let's say, as these material surfaces are being modified. And, and that's part of the focus of this talk. So, um, okay, very good. So the, uh, the, way, the way I've organized this talk is um, a very short introduction to our group. So this is the Radiation Surface Science and Engineering Lab, which I've led now for, I don't know, it's been, I think, close to two decades, maybe. I can't remember. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, we're going to talk about what I mean by in situ observation. And in particular, how do we do this under a, a, an approach to manipulate matter? Um, and there are two primary tools that we use in my lab. So we use, we use XPS and low energy ion scattering. So I'm going to delve a little bit deeper on the low energy ion scattering technique uh, given that that's a, not only a highly surface sensitive technique, technique, but is one that we've been able to develop and, and I would say um, use in, in a lot more uh, depth with, um, within the context of ion induced modification. And I selected three case studies to share with you basically a survey of three different problems that involved a very, very practical issues um, related to low dimensional state systems. And in particular, those questions or problems um, had to invoke some way to, to capture the dynamic changes and that were occur occurring in these systems and therefore required uh, the type of techniques and the type of approach that, that I'll be talking about today. Uh, very quickly, um, today we're going to focus on one of the uh, research, research things in my group, which is complex nanomaterials. There are two other um, fairly active research areas that I won't have time today. But our group really is focused on what we call self-organized uh, material and self-organized matter. And in particular, we, we explore how certain nanostructures or scaled structures around a material can be manipulated 
uh, with uh, energetic particles. And in, and in this context, we're talking about um, energetic ions that are extracted, for instance, from plasma, and then utilized to transform surfaces and materials into structures that could be utilized for many different applications. Um, and that's the sort of the introduction, general introduction to our group. So I mentioned the word plas plasma, and of course, as, as you know, the plasma state is ubiquitous in the universe. Um, if you look at this plot of, of uh, density and temperature, uh, we deal with plasmas in, in many different contexts, whether it's uh, terrestrial plasmas, um, or let's say plasmas that are generated in fusion devices, or, or low temperature plasmas that are used to process, process materials. Um, we find plasmas, of course, in the, in the universe. And part of our goal is to understand how do we think about extracting these plasmas and understanding the use of these plasmas to modify materials. Now, plasma modification has been used for decades, so it's nothing new. But our ability to manipulate uh, material surfaces with plasmas, our ability to understand how we can, um, in a very, uh, let's say, rational design approach to materials design with plasmas, it, um, it begs the question, how do we understand how to manipulate it in the relevant physical scales that are involved? And we find that in the interaction of plasmas and materials, there is a pretty complex uh, interaction and coupling both in time and length of the plasma state and the condensed matter. And if we're able to understand the, the essence and the inherent interaction between these energetic particles and these surfaces, we'll be able to manipulate uh, a, a wide variety of materials to transform these surfaces to structures that we can use. So for example, going from you know, highly ordered structures to more complex and even disordered structures. And part of our premise here is that we're, we're able to understand how to couple what's called the material response rate against the stimulus rate. The stimulus rate being, in this case, the energy imparted by energetic ions that we extract from a plasma and that we fine tune in order to couple that into the material. And typically when you hear about energetic particles and plasmas, you think about potential damage that can be introduced to your material. But we actually go in and we uh, focus on the balance of the stimulus rate to the material response rate so that we can reach metastable phases where eventually we can get um, self-organized structures where we manipulate the defects in such a, in such a way that these atoms can self-organize and uh, eventually we can design these materials. Now, I won't, I won't delve into all the details that are involved in ion surface interactions. We won't have time here, but the the point is is that when you think of energetic ions that are interacting with a material surface we are going much beyond some of the more fundamental fundamental and basic concepts such as physical sputtering which is the removal of atoms as an ion interacts with a material surface and there are ways for us to to um, again tune the parameters of these energetic particles so that defects can evolve on our surface and we're able to then enable these atoms, for example, to self-organize on these surfaces and not only uh, approach what we call kinetic roughening, which is basically a random roughening of a surface, but we can direct these atoms to self-organize. And I'll show you an example of this. But one challenge that comes right away 
in being able to manipulate these material surfaces in a, an effective way is that we would like to understand how the surface and the interface with our radiation field, in this case, the stimulant, uh, for example, the energetic ions that emanate, let's say from a plasma, we would like to know or understand how that interface is evol it's evolving in time. And um, this is quite different from the conventional approach in materials design where we have isolated systems that are organized, equilibrated. We are looking at trying to probe, if you will, a very um, shallow depth of atoms, anywhere from a monolayer to a few nanometers. We need to be able to probe that depth while we're doing the radiation. That is, the context is one where the spatial temporal scales become relevant in our design of these characterization tools. So we begin to discuss or think about how do we envision in situ or in vivo diagnosis to be able to study this very active coupled irradiation driven interface. And I would add that the reason we get the enhanced tunability, it's because we go beyond the traditional thermodynamic based uh, mechanisms in modifying these materials. We're in fact uh, introducing an additional source of modification through the energetics of these ions, which then in turn um, enable us to modify those atoms and modify that system dynamically. And, and then the question is, how do, we, how do we measure that interaction in such a way that we understand the interaction so that we can fine tune it? A lot of the work that we've done sort of culminated in this review paper. It's an invited review paper that, and I would encourage you to, um, to go through. It has a lot of the detail that I'm talking about here in case you have further questions. But in this paper, again, we pose this, this uh, or motivate this premise of, in order for us to understand this interface, we really need to go to atomic level level um, methodologies or measurements to understand these self-organized systems. There's another accompanying paper that was published a while back um, that, that I also will be touching on in, in, this, in this talk. And that is a paper based on some of the work we did in, <clears throat> related to EUV lithography. All right. so. Let me also point out that it's not only important for us to think of um, the physical scales as we think about experiments, but we also, in order for us to complement understanding of the of these systems, we need to introduce effective multi-scale mo modeling. And in particular for the coupling of plasmas and materials, the evolution of defects um, requires, in fact, that we bring in some of the some of the modeling tools. Uh, given that some of these ballistic and, in some cases, diffusional um, diffusional scales are, in fact, out of reach for a lot of the uh, experimental um, capabilities that we have in order for us to study them in situ. There are, of course, systems that we can use that capture, for example, example spatial scales um, and even some temporal scales of interest. But our, our focus is really looking at um, not only defect generation, but how the ions, in fact, are behaving. And so we then go into design um, for, let's say, for the tool set for our characterization of irradiation driven material surfaces uh, <clears throat> with a design in this way. So first of all, we, in, in our design, we have what we, what we call a, um, 
a modifying source that we can introduce on the surface. That modifying source can we can we can vary, uh, for example, the type of species, the mass. We can vary the angle. We can vary the energy. We can vary, let's say, the fluence. And so we have control over that incident, those incident particles that we're introducing. So that's one aspect of, of, the, of the system. The second apt aspect of the system is that while we're doing the radiation, we're able in some way to probe that surface. And not only the surface itself, but also what we call the subsurface. That is, we define a surface as the first layer of atoms. That's how we define surface. The subsurface would be then, you know, a few fractions of, let's say a nanometer or so or below. So, so the intention is to be able to probe that surface and subsurface to give us the composition, the chemistry and other parameters as we do the radiation. And then finally, in addition to that, we complement those techniques with techniques that are able, able to probe the emitted species. As it turns out, the inherent mechanism of energetic particles that are interacting with the surface, those energetic particles are not only going to drive changes to the surface itself, but they're going to be, as you can imagine, reactions in which some of these species are emitted from the surface. They can be sputtered, they Sir, can be yep. sublimated. You too, thank you. Um, and in doing so, those particles are going to carry information about the mechanisms that are at play. Could be their energy distribution, their mass distribution, et cetera. So all these techniques have to be conducted in situ. Um, they need to be conducted while you're doing the radiation. That, that is the premise and the design of our experiments. So we utilize a number of different techniques. Um, one technique is known as low energy ion scattering. Um, I'll, I'll go over this technique as we go through some of the case studies. But just to give you kind of a brief introduction, the idea is to use incident energetic ion that comes in and interacts with, with the surface and then scatters at some scattering angle. And the technique is such that we are able to detect only those particles that scatter as ions. And in scattering most, you know, 99% of particles ions that come in are readily neutralized. So we're basically capturing only the less than 1% of ions that survive uh, neutralization, which end up being the ions that are scattering with basically the top, the top layer of the surface. So that's one technique we use. <clears throat> the other technique we use is called direct recoil um, spectroscopy, which is very similar, but instead of the incident particle backscattering and being detected, um, we are detecting the recoil particles. So these would be the actual target atoms that are recoiled and that are emitted into our detector as ions. Again, those tend to be, you know, very, very small percentage of the, of the actual recoiled particles that we're capturing. Now, in my career, we've designed these facilities in a number of places where I've been. So I started my career at Argonne National, National Lab, moved on to Purdue in Illinois. And anyway, we, we've been building and developing these in situ facilities for a long time now. One of the first ones we designed um, were designed to um, conduct both what we call backward ion, um, ion uh, scattering spectroscopy and forward ion scattering spectroscopy. You can see this in this ge geometry. For some of the studies that, you will, that I'll be presenting here, you will see this geometry. And, and in addition, in the system, in addition to the ion sources, 
which we call the probes, which run about two orders of magnitude lower flux than the modifying sources. So you, what you're seeing here are the modification sources. These are sources that are trying to modify the, the material surface in some, some way. Here's another image. As you see the um, geometry of these uh, probes. So here's just an example of the technique and the raw data that you get. This is um, <clears throat> spectra from the from the low energy ion scatter scattering. We're using hel helium um, ions that are back scattering here, and uh, you see that. In, in this case, we have a corresponding peak to oxygen and one to ruthenium. And uh, the way the technique works is, is simply based on you know, elastic scattering, uh, very simple physics involved. Um, the, again, only the ions that survive uh, neutralization are detected here. So let me, um, let me talk to you about the first case study. So the first case study was a um, project that we had with ASML and Intel. And these were related to uh, what was known as tin contaminants in these very large EUV lithogra lithography machines. Now, back when we started this work um, almost two decades ago, uh, these devices were not even developed. I mean, we were, we were we were running uh, tin-based plasmas against mirrors. And one of the challenges with um, these devices were that uh, these uh, tin-dominated plasmas would bring not only energetic uh, tin particles to very sensitive mirrors, but also they would bring tin, um, tin atoms, evaporated tin. And one big question was, during the radiation and during the exposure to, to uh, these plasmas, the question is, where did where would the tin go? Because the tin, and so here's an example of again, this is what I'm presenting here is basically a survey of results, but here's an example of how these institute tools end, ended up. Um, enabling us to decipher where the tin would go and what were the fundamental mechanisms and how they evolved during the time scale of modification to be able to pinpoint how these tin particles not only contaminated the surface of the mirror, but if you were able to tune the plasma itself, you'd be able to self-clean the surfaces of these mirrors. Now, the practical aspect of it was, okay, ultimately, how do we self-clean? But fundamentally, the theoretical aspects were to understand how do energetic tin particles with thermalized tin atoms that end up arriving at the surface, how, what's their interplay? What is the characteristic length of interaction between them? There was There were a lot of conjectures that were um, where there, there were a lot of uh, you know thinking that basically the tin atoms just deposited on the films and it was a matter of just cleaning the film. But we later found out that you were able to, and cleaning the film was not trivial, it was very difficult. So we found from our studies that there was a combination of energy and fluence that allowed the the tin to self clean. And, and we found this by doing some um, in situ probing of the first layer of, <clears throat> first layer of atoms. So what you're seeing here is a, a profile in depth of angstroms. And you see here, for example, this is one nanometer. And we were able to probe this on a palladium mirror, the amount of tin that was arriving. And again, this, this tin, this amount of tin was driving much of the failure of these mirrors in these large lithography machines. And so by conducting these in situ studies, so we conducted many studies where we actively looked at where the tin, where the tin would deposit, we found that it, you know, most of the tin remained in the first nanometer. 
and that if we if we decoupled the deposited 10 thermal atoms and the energetic 10 ions by understanding the the um, 10 implantation from ISS studies in situ. So what you're seeing here is basically 10 deposited on these uh, uh, ruthenium and rhodium mirrors um, by understanding their the physics, if you will, during the um, evolution of exposure to these 10 plasmas, we were able to fine tune the energy and be able to then have the 10 energetic ions, in fact, re-sputter material off the mirror in a way that it could be self-sustaining. Obviously, of course, once we gave them the number when this was found, uh, you know, the whole project ended, right? And then, and then they kept going to save a $300 billion industry. We kept going because there was still a lot of physics that were still unanswered. So, so that study kept going for some time. Another case study involved the use of very thin films that were used to nanopattern semiconductor su surfaces. And this study, it was a two-part study. study. Uh, one had to do with nanopatterning silicon. So how do we create, for example, um, one to two nanometer uh, silicon, silicon structures, self-organized structures, that we can do it in a scalable way. So the idea was to use energetic particles to uh, irradiate silicon surfaces and then be able to create nanopatterns on them. Now it sounds very it sounds you know straightforward, but as you'll see, it was it was it was challenging. And then the second part to the study, okay, how do we do it? If we can do it on silicon, is there a way to do it on compound semiconductors? So the first study started with a mystery. Um, it started by a number of groups irradiating the surface of silicon. And when silicon is irradiated, uh, during the time of irradiation, if you have if you have only argon ions irradiating the silicon surface by itself, you're not able to you're not able to induce any patterning on the surface. There's no nanostructure formation from the energetic ions, and it was an indirect. In fact, it was an accidental discovery that found that. As they were doing the radiation, um, they found that the resputtering of the of the holders of their silicon samples, the metal that was being resputtered, in this case, I think it was moly, it was that moly, those moly atoms that were arriving with argon that in fact led to a um, prompt and and um, self-organized structures that formed on silicon. So again, without, without any kind of impurity or metal contribution, you couldn't get patterns. As soon as you introduce some composition of metal, you got patterns on silicon. And these were not, just to be clear, the structures you see here is not the metal that's nanostructured. This is pure silicon. So we, we, um, we then established this premise that if we were to introduce a very thin layer of a metal that in essence would form a silicide with silicon, we would be able to then disrupt the surface um, in such a way that we could get what's called phase separation. That is, in the surface, we could get a metastable state between the silicon and the metal. And we conjectured that that would create regions where the material would sputter differently at a different rate. And that's how we would be able to control the 
removal or the erosion rate of components eventually being able to design silicon nanopatterns on the surface. Now, again, what I'm, ma I'm making statements here that are very general. And I think it's important to, for you to, to appreciate that the parameter space that you see here, for example, Y200 EV argon was not, you know, was not an energy that was just um, selected at random. I mean, it took a number of studies to get to this place. But I like to use this example to show you the tools we use to get there. So here's some in situ data. And this is aerial data with XPS. So we have a two dimensional detector. And uh, what we're doing here is we have a sample <clears throat> where one part of the surface is coated with gold and the other part of the surface is only is silicon, bare silicon. And so you see that here in, in the in-situ image. And we began to radiate and you, we found that the surface that had no gold coating uh, did not form any patterns, but the surface with the gold coating uh, resulted in these really nice high resolution um, silicon structures on the surface. So you see they're about two or so nanometers in, in size. So of course the question is again, what was the mechanism that was driving this? And so we went in and did a number of studies where <clears throat> we were using a combination of the ion scattering spectroscopy that I shared with you earlier and X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And we found that there was a unique um, transition influence of irradiation combined with the amount of metal on the surface. So to remind you, the metal films that we put, that we deposited, were about 10 nanometers, very thin, uh, thin films. And as we radiated, there were no patterns formed. It wasn't until we reached ion-induced mixing and eventually about 2%, 5% of the metal that we were able to reach patterning. And we confirmed this with in situ um, GSAC studies that we conducted at Brookhaven. So this is a, a facility uh, that we used in the previous NSLS, uh, the former NSLS, I should say. And we had a, a beam line that we shared with Carl Ludwig out of Boston University. And we used a broad, broad beam ion source. So we were radiating what we could look with GSACs and look at the structure evolution. And indeed we found that, confirmed that about two to 4% metallic impurity was necessary to start seeing these um, spontaneous self-organization on silicon. The next study involved uh, the study of the, these um, compound semiconductors. So the question was, it seemed from the studies we did with silicon, these, these were single element semiconductors, that we, wouldn't, we would not be able to pattern them under the conditions that we, that we ran unless we had metal that would act, if you will, as a disruptor, if you will, of the radiation. So we then conjectured here, um, we wanted to ask the question, if we have a two component system, how would that component system result in patterns? Or you know, could they result in patterns? Part of it was based on, on the work of one of my colleagues, Stefan Fosco, who had published results of low energy irradiation of gallium antimonite and showed that for certain conditions, you would be able to, to, um, to pattern the surfaces of these compound semiconductors. Now, <clears throat> folks have been doing this for some time back in the 90s, where they had irradiated these materials and they would find these very interesting structures on the surface. But the key question was, what was the mechanism? What was the driver of the fact that these patterns were spontaneously coming up? at very specific fluences, um, you know, how was that mechanism playing? 
our role during radiation. So we, we conducted a number of studies where we radiated gallium antimonide. Here's, this is the work that we did with Stefan Fosco and a number of my students, uh, two of them that got their PhDs on this work. Well, we, we are creating low energy um, nanostructures on gallium antimonide. And we found a very interesting transition for very specific fluences. And of course, we were asking the, asking the question, you know, at that point, what was driving their patterning? So of course, at this high energy, 500 EV, one, one obvious answer to that was, well, what you're doing is you're etching away material. And as you etch away material, if there are two components, you're etching material of one component more than another. That seemed very reasonable. So we did another study where we carried the energy of the ions from a sputter, sputtering dominated regime down to sub sputtering threshold regimes. So this was the study of Osman El and his PhD that demonstrated that you don't need, you don't need to invoke this concept or this mechanism of etching or sputtering, that there's something, some other mechanism at play since we're also able to get patterns on these gallium antimonide surfaces, even down to 25, 25 electron volts. So the question is, you know, what was driving these, what were driving these, these mechanisms? So um, in order to study this, to answer that question, we carried out a number of different studies. Um, again, using a combination of lies, XPS, our angular resolved XPS, where we combine these tools in order to elucidate the composition evolution on these surfaces. And immediately we were able to find some very interesting, um, very interesting mechanisms. The first one was in fact an unexpected, which had to do with the role, with the role of intrinsic oxide, intrinsic impurities on your surfaces. I think you know in this community, you probably very well know that you know materials, all material surfaces carry some form of intrinsic oxide or carbon. And in order for you to understand the monolayer mechanisms, you have to understand these oxides. And so because gallium and antimonide are very reactive, we then found a mechanism to re remove the oxide. And we found that the mechanism for patterning was basically um, arrested in time, if you will, by the fact that, that that oxide layer existed. That is, you couldn't generate patterns until that oxide layer was removed. So further studies in our facility. So this is the Ignis facility that's back at Illinois. Um, you know, we're, we're still running that facility now. Is equipped with you know, all of these techniques in situ um, and un enable us to, to watch, if you will, how these surfaces evolve. And for these, this particular study on the nanopatterns, we combined um, a number of different experiments that not only induced the nanopatterning, but also we conducted uh, lies in situ and, and during the radiation. So I'm not going to get into the all the standardization that we did uh, using XPS and using um, low energy ion scattering, but I'll get to the spectra. This is a spectra for uh, low energy ion scattering, and we found that there were a number of different um, features that change over the course of irradiation, and we were able to correlate those features with the moment or the time, the instance that we would get spontaneous patterns. So we combined that information with GSACs and found an interesting mechanism where if we plot, if we plot the uh, antimony composition um, over fluence, we found that it was not until the antimonide composition as a function of dose 
until that became the, dom the dominant uh, composition in the near surface. And this was due to ion induced segregation to the first few monolayers. We found that that's when we had the onset of patterning. And it would vary for different species. So for example, for the heavier species, the onset of patterning would occur earlier in time. But what was really interesting was what was going on in the subsurface. So as I opened this talk, I had mentioned that it's not only relevant for us to use one technique in situ to measure the surface composition, because you might think, well, you use ion scattering to just measure composition, right? You measure how much intimonite is there to how much gall gallium is there. But that's really not what's relevant. What, what I want to emphasize is the relevance is with the dynamics of these components as they are moved or they change through from the radiation from surf surface layers to the surface layer. And we found that is in fact when the antimonide actually reaches the first layer of atoms that we start getting the spontaneous patterning. We're continuing this study now and there's a lot of work still in trying to understand this spontaneous patterning. And we're finding that there's an irradiation accelerated uh, kinetics that is happening with the antimony and with the gallium atoms. So we're doing multi-scale atomistic simulations to understand this, to capture the prompt time scales that are missing in the experiment. And Mike Lively is working on this in his PhD, <clears throat> in his PhD work. All right, so let me now summarize here. So I hope that the talk gave you an overview and a survey where we can use in situ uh, surface characterization to shed some light on these mechanisms. And I'm hoping with this group, with this community here at Penn State, which was, <clears throat> which was something I got very excited about when I arrived here, uh, where those of you who are working with 2D materials will find um, these techniques or these approaches very useful to your work. We are building the next generation facility. Every time I move, you know, it turns out that I'm building a new facility. So we're building and designing this facility with my students. Um, this facility will be ready, uh, hopefully by the summer, this summer. And for those of you who are interested in collaborating, I would love to do that. We have a lot of techniques that we're adding to this facility um, that I think will be very useful for some of the work you do. Finally, I wanted to just recognize um, all the work that you see here, which is about a third of the work we do in my group, is due to these incredible individuals. Um, and that's, you know, I'm blessed to be able to to be part of their growth. So with that, I'll stop here for any questions. Thank you. You may unmute yourself temporarily by pushing the space button, or you can just unmute yourself um, on your name and then remute whenever you're done. If you're shy, you can chat something in the chat box. I gotta look for the, where that chat box is. <laughs> Hi, I'll ask a question. Yes. Uh, what drives the patterning? Uh, why does why do the dots space themselves apart to begin with? That's a great question. Um, and so part of it, part of it has to do with the composition of tin being at the surface. And the part of it has to do with the subsurface composition. What it turns out that when we get these um, phase separation of composition, as the tin starts to enrich the surface, the gallium and tin atoms begin to um, segregate to themselves. That is their mobility and the difference in their mobility begins to drive 
this lateral separation across the, the subsurface. And as you begin to, um, as you begin to drive the compositional change um, in depth, as, and, as well as laterally, we begin to see that the, and there is some level of erosion. So, so these structures that I'm referring to here are structures that are exposed to, to 500 EV ions. So mm -hmm. there is some removal of atoms. And as these are removed, then uh, we believe that by diffusional mechanisms, they're reconstructing and forming the patterns you see the pillar structures that you see. Now, um, the big question is, well, that's fine, but what happens when you go to sub sputtering threshold energies? And we have not done, um, we have not done the full studies to understand that transition yet. That's part of the next, next study where we're trying to understand that. Great, thank you. Hey, JP, I have another question, maybe related to the yes. Susan question. Yeah. It's also about the um, like the nano patterning, or it's, it looks a little bit similar to the surface reconstruction. If we are using the single crystal, uh, like you do some annealing, and the, the gas may induce the, the, the surface reconstruction. Um, so my question is, do you see the change if you change the type of radiation, say positive ion or negative ion? on the same material, will that change the pattern? And also, if you change the time, is this a uh, static? Like, uh, reach, it will finally reach the equilibrium, or it will keep changing as time elapses? Yeah, that, that, those are great questions, uh, Fefe. Um, let, me, let me answer the first one. So, um, you know, we have seen differences in radiation um, certainly as you change the, the uh, species and the charge state, you can influence the way that the structures change in terms of size and shape. Um, what's also interesting is that you don't get patterns for all conditions. So for example, you could get, you can, you can uh, for example, reach smooth surfaces when you're exposed to krypton ions as opposed to let's say argon ions for the same energy. So we know it's, a, it's definitely a mechanism that is driven by the energy deposition density near the surface. Because it's also dependent on that, there is a time scale in which you spontaneously generate these patterns. Um, but it turns out that going with the earlier question that um, if, if you modify the subsurface um, phase separation in such a way you can reach, for example, a metastable phase. And that metastable phase we, we will, will remain stable. That is, these structures that you see here, you can keep those structures. They, they will remain um, you know, this size and this shape for, for a very long time. So they're, they're stable. Once your radiation is complete and all the thermal processes are complete, um, these structures remain um, very stable over very long periods of time. We have not tried negative ions to go back also to your question in, uh, in these studies. I see. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Yeah, thank you. Any do you other? see much? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. It's do you do you see much effect if you change the substrate temperature, or are the energy of the ions so much more important that it doesn't matter much? Yeah, that's a great question too. So, and, and I didn't clarify. So all these all these samples um, were kept at room temperature. Uh, the ion beam itself, because of the low latency only raises the surface about 50 degrees Celsius, sometimes 100. We, can, we control that by actively cooling the sample. However, the temperature, Suzanne, as you can imagine, definitely affects the patterning because um, 
now we get into this interesting question about what does temperature mean, right? So, so we get into questions of thermal temperature of the system. So of course your sample uh, versus the localized kinetic energy of the ensemble that we're modifying in the cascade. And certainly the radiation driven mechanisms influencing influence the prompt mechanisms. The latter temporal mechanism, diffusional mechanisms are set by the system temperature. So for example, these structures, if you increase the temperature to about 30% of the melting point of gallium and timonide, these structures would be much wider and you wouldn't get the heights mm -hmm. that you see here. And so you're definitely influencing two different time scales. The radiation influences the prompt time scales. And, and let's say your system temperature is influenced from the diffusional time scales of all the freely migrating defects that remain. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have a question in the chat box. Um, they're wondering whether you work with 2D materials and how much beam damage is usually caused by lice in 2D materials? So the answer is, I, I've worked with graphene before. When I was at Purdue, we had a project on graphene and we used, um, we used this setup to both look at, we used direct recoil spectroscopy to look at deuterium. These are hydrogen isotopes, ions that were introduced by low energy, um, by low energy gun implanting on the graphene layer. And as you can imagine, the deuterium atoms that we were implanting were to disrupt the, the band gap, right? To basically fine tune and create a band gap in, in graphene. Um, when we ran lice to look, when we, let, when we ran direct recoil to characterize the surface you can tune the flux of particles down below to about 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th, up to about 10 to the 11th CGS, this is flux. So that over the course of modification for the graphene example was about to get the, the right dose of deuterium, we had to go to about 10 minutes. The damage was uh, probably below about 10 to the negative five DPA, which means that uh, we got a, a very low number amounts of defects in the region of the graphene. Now, of course, for us, part of the challenge with that project was that you can induce defects inherently and already modify the band gap. The band gap. So we, in essence, found a way to fine tune defects in graphene to modify that band gap with very little damage induced by the probing technique. Um, we have not done any other, I didn't, I have not done any other 2D material work at Illinois. You know, there's some interest to do some of that. I would love to work with, with this community to begin to do some of that work, that work here at Penn State. And I don't know who asked, but if you're interested, <laughs> to work on 2D materials with us in our facility, please email me, send me your info. We can talk. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. If you do have a question, you don't want to talk, go ahead and send it to me in the chat box, but otherwise go ahead and unmute yourself. So if no one asks a question, maybe I take this uh, opportunity to ask one more. Of course. Uh, back to the orientation, I was also curious. So it will generate some nano pattern on top of the surface, but what about the single cone? The cone will also have the one crystal orientation exposed. Do you notice the? Is there any orientation uh, has a preference after the irradiation? I understand yeah. there are some amorphous film cover that, but what about beneath this amorphous film? Yeah, so there is an amorphous film of about 
um, few fractions of a nanometer on the surface. Uh, and we anneal that out. In fact, the, 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 <clears throat> the silicon nanopatterns that we generated could anneal, could anneal that out, as you see here. Um, the question on direction and let's say the textured, the texture, the preferred orientation of the atoms um, really depends on the final state of defects. We have not really studied this part, Fefe, in a lot of detail. Uh, we would love to do that with, um, you know, OIM or, uh, you know, a technique using, uh, using TEM to look at the orientation and to find out along, uh, along the pillars uh, how the orientation is changing. I mean, one question is also how the composition is changing along the pillar, let's say of gallium and timonide um, structures that we're making. Uh, but we have not done any systematic study to look at crystallographic orientation. I see. Thank you. I was wondering if this has some like a, a selectivity to certain orientation. Oh, I'm sure it does. It looks like, a, like the chemical etching of the silicon wafers. And sometimes the chemical etching will uh, have selective uh, like orientation. Absolutely. I think it does because, as you know, the transfer of energy of these ions will, of course, <clears throat> be closely related with where the energy is being transferred between atoms. And so preferred orientation likely will drive that. <clears throat> um, and likely that could be the reason why in silicon in 100, the metal um, atoms and purities that are interacting energetically could be disrupting that growth. And that's how you get the spontaneous directional preference for certain silicon atoms to self-organize. Yeah, and if you check like the wolf structure of the different interfacial energy or surface energy of the different metals, maybe that can maybe validate with the experiment to see, you can see. If yeah, that would be, happening. yeah, <laughs> that would be awesome to study, Fei-Fei. So um, again, I did this talk because I love to start collaborating with all you folks here at Penn State. Um, you know, it was one of the reasons I got very excited about Penn State because there's just some incredible work being done here in the area of materials and and um, I'd be very happy to to um, to collaborate. Yeah, I can maybe we can discuss later some I'm also very interested in your new setup. It seems very powerful. Yeah, isn't it, <laughs> isn't it cool? System. Yeah. Yeah. I mean we you know, we've been working on these facilities for a long time. This will be the fourth generation facility. Every generation would do something new. I designed this new facility, keeping the um, 2D materials community in mind. So, so there's my email for everyone. So, you know, feel free, alon at psu.edu, send me an email and we can start talking okay well i think we're near the end of time thank you so much dr alon for agreeing to to speak at this 2dcc webinar yeah. um, just so everybody knows um, we have more webinars coming up so stay tuned to the email lists um, where these will be announced and on our website um, again thank you so much dr alon and uh, we hope that we can um, see some collaboration with you in the future Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you, Eric, and thanks everybody for for um, spending your one o'clock time with me. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye.